Pangkor Island is situated off the west coast of the Malaysian Peninsula, in the Straits of Malacca. It sits within the state of Parak, which means silver, a state that is rich in tin. Pangkor's written history begins in the records of the European merchant adventures of the 17th century. But long before the Straits of Malacca became the conduit of European commerce, these waters were roiled by the rivalries of the Malay archipelago, that great crescent of islands curving out at Asia's southeastern extremity, between the Indian and Pacific Oceans. Poised at the confluence of destinies, Pangkor has witnessed a long and turbulent history. Once upon a time, Pangkor Island became a refuge and hideout for local fishers, merchants and pirates in the Straits of Malacca. In addition, it is also a stopover and vacation spot for kings. The main specialty of Pangkor Island at that time was its quite attractive and beautiful beach. Kings, pirates, travelers, traders and soldiers often visit to enjoy the peace and privilege of Pangkor Island. Pangkor Island became an important site from which to control trading in the Strait of Malacca. Historically, Pangkor Island has provided shelter for fishermen, merchants and pirates who shuttled through the Strait of Malacca with its superior bay topography. The island was frequently visited by pirates roaming the seas around the island. They robbed boats with commercial goods plying from Kedah to Parak and vice versa. They hide themselves on the hills on the island. The history of Pangkor Island can be traced back to the 17th century when the Dutch built a fort on the island to control the tin trade in Parak. Pangkor Island was called Pulo Dinding during the Dutch colonial period, so the Dutch called the fort as Fort Dinding. In the Malay language, the fort is called Kota Belanda. Parak was under the authority of Arche in the early 17th century. The Sultanate of Aceh subjected most parts of the Malay Peninsula to continual harassment. Aceh's influence on Parak began to wane when the Dutch East India Company VOC, arrived, in the mid-17th century. In 1650, the Sultanate of Aceh ordered Parak's Sotan, Sotan Muzaffar Shah II to sign an agreement with the VOC, on condition that the tin trade would be conducted exclusively with Arche's merchants. By the following year, the VOC had secured a monopoly over the tin trade, setting up a store in Parak. Following the long competition between Arche and the VOC over Parak's tin trade, on 15 December 1653, the two parties jointly signed a treaty with Parak granting the Dutch exclusive rights to tin extracted from mines located in the state. Therefore, in 1670 an order was issued from Batavia, the administrative centre of the Dutch East India Company to build a warehouse made of wood to store tin ore. Hence a warehouse was erected at a strategic location in Teluk Gedong, Pankor. Ten years later the walls of the warehouse were replaced with bricks. Hence, to take over and monopolize the production of tin mines in Parak, the Dutch fort in Pankor Island was built. To block their competitors from trading in Parak, the island was mainly used to prevent the English from occupying the place. William Dampier was a British explorer. He arrived at Pankor Island in 1689 and also visited the Dutch castle. According to his records, the Dutch fort resembled a house with thick walls made of stone and a towering height of about 30 feet and covered overhead. In William Dampier's report, he also briefly described the degree of fear of the Dutch for the local Malays. It is said that an English captain took an Englishman and his wife to visit the local Dutch governor, and was arrested by the governor. Invited to a dinner at his home, Unexpectedly when they had just taken their seats, they suddenly heard someone shouting, Malays. As a result, the Dutch governor and his entourage abandoned the three of them, jumped out of the window and fled. When the three of them when they arrived at the fort, they saw where the frightened governor was, and all the guards were on high alert. 
The Dutch blockaded the coast of Perak to prevent their tin trade from being damaged by local Malays and some pirates, and the Dutch fort on Pankor Island also deterred local pirates from encroaching on those with Anshan or Teluk Anson, now known as Teluk Intan. Malay ships that carried tin to Penang for sale, so the pirates also attacked Dutch forts many times. A year after William Dampier's visit the fort, in 1690, a group of Malays led by Pang Lima Kulop destroyed the building and killed several Dutchmen. As a result, the warehouse was abandoned until 1743, when the Dutch returned and repaired it. A force of 60 soldiers, including 30 Europeans was placed to guard the fort until 1748, when the force was disbanded and abandoned. In 1784, the Dutch built another warehouse near Sungai Perak. As a result, the Dutch government in Batavia directed that the older warehouse in Pulau Pankor to be abandoned. After the Dutch fort was abandoned in 1748, it was reconstructed later by the National Museum, Museum Nagara, in 1973. The fort was rebuilt according to the original shape and dimensions, measures 3 by 5 meters and 6.7 meters high without a roof as they did not know the original plans. In 1978, it was gazetted as a National Heritage and Historical Site under the Antiquities Act 1976, and turned into a tourism site today. A short distance from the fort is an intriguing stone carving locally known as Batu Bursarat in Malay or Sacred Written Rock. The Tiger Rock is a large rock at Kampung Teluk Gedong inscribed with graffiti made by Dutch soldiers in the 1700s. These soldiers were based in the Dutch fort just about 200 meters away, in the years 1743 to 1748 and the date 1743 is carved on the rock five times. The sacred rock is regarded as a historical monument and a modern roof has been built over the top to protect it from the weather. There are some mysterious stories about Batu Bursarat. Some villagers claim that this rock is growing over time. It becomes bigger and bigger. Some visitors believe this rock is connected with the earth energy. We can feel it with our heart by touching the rock with our both hands. Batu Bursarat measures 10.7 meters long, 4.6 meters wide and 4.3 meters tall. From a distance, it looks like a typical granite boulder, but when inspected, you'll notice the carved etchings on its side. The carved drawing shows an image of a tiger trying to maul a child. According to the locals, it has been engraved by the Dutch in remembrance of the Dutch dignitary's son taken by a tiger on the island. Allegedly, the child got lost while playing near the boulders in 1743, during the supremacy of Sultan Muzaffar Sire III. Another disturbing version of the story claimed that the Bugis and Malay tribe abducted and killed the Dutch child, to revenge the cruelty and abusive treatment of the Dutch to the locals. When the Dutch soldiers searched for the boy, the local people created a story that they saw the child carried away by a tiger. However, other villages in Pankor Island believed that it was not the tiger that had taken the child, but rather the dissatisfied Malay warriors who wanted to free Pankor from the Dutch. With this story, the soldiers carved the inscription on the rock showing the Malays as the tiger. This is the reason why it is called as Tiger Rock today. Besides the carved drawings, there are also letters, symbols and numbers etched on the stone. These include the Dutch insignia, VOC, which stands for Verenig de Oostendische Compagnie, or the Dutch East India Company, the letters, if Carlo 1743, and two round-shaped leaves. Some researchers disagreed with the above apocryphal stories, they claim that it is clear that this image is not a tiger, but is in fact the Dutch coat of arms that was in use at the time the graffiti was made. The artist may not have been too skilled, but the animal is a lion. See the tail tiger's tails do not end in a hairy tuft, and it is carrying a quiver of arrows and a sword, not a young boy. 
Even the line around the drawing is the same shape as that on the coat of arms red shield. When we talk about the history of Pankor, we will think of the Pankor Treaty. The Pankor Treaty is a very important event in the history of Malaysia in which it marked the official intervention of the British in the administration of the Malaya states. The Pankor Treaty was signed on 20 January 1874. On the colonial steamship HMS Pluto, anchored off the island of Pankor, off the coast of Perak, between Raja Abdullah of Perak and Sir Andrew Clark on behalf of the British government. Perak is an important tin-producing area in the 19th century, leading Britain, which had already colonized Penang, Malacca and Singapore, to consider Perak of significant importance. In 1871, Sultan Ali of Perak passed away. Raja Abdullah, as heir apparent, should have succeeded to the throne. But because he had not been present at the burial of the late Sotan Ali, the state officials with the advice of Ingar Ibrahim, minister of Rarit, have decided to appoint Raja Bendahara Ishmael as the Sultan's successor. The actions and plans of Ingar Ibrahim were greatly angered by Raja Abdullah. To repay the act, he helped the Gi Hin faction against the Haishan faction which supported by Ingar Ibrahim in the Rarit Wars. The Rarat Wars started in July 1861. The conflict was fought among two Chinese secret societies, known as Yi Hin led by Qin Ah Yam and Hai San led by Chung Keng Kui, constantly waged battle against each other for control of the tin mines. Raja Abdullah asked the British for help in solving these two problems. He turned to Tan Kim Cheng his friend in Singapore, who was a well-known businessman. Tan Kim Cheng, together with an English merchant in Singapore, drafted a letter to Governor Sir Andrew Clark, which Abdullah signed. The letter expressed Abdullah's desire to place Perak under British protection, and to have a man of sufficient abilities to show him a good system of government. On the 26th of September 1872, Chung Keng Kui had already presented a petition, signed by himself and 44 other Chinese leaders, seeking British interference following the attack of 12,000 men of Chung Shan by 2,000 men of Sen Ning. The British immediately saw this as an opportunity to expand its influence in Southeast Asia and to strengthen its monopoly on tin exports. As a result, the Pankor Treaty of 1874 was signed as the trade activities of the Straits settlements were seriously affected by the disputes in Perak, the governor, Andrew Clark, was put under pressure to ask Britain to abandon the policy of non-interference with the Malay states in order to ensure the production of tin mines. The three parties involved in the Pankor Treaty were the British, the Malay rulers, and the Chinese, leaders of Hai San and Yi Hin. One of the terms of treaty was that Raja Abdullah would be acknowledged as the legitimate Sotan of Perak, and to receive a British resident whose advice had to be sought and adhered to all matters except those pertaining to the religion and customs of the Malays. With this treaty, the British introduced the residential system in Malaya and James Wheeler Woodford Birch or J.W.W. Birch was appointed as the first British resident in Perak. However, Birch did not honor several terms of the treaty, especially those dealing with the practices of the Malay people and Islam. His action had sparked fury and dissatisfaction among the Malays, which led to his assassination on 2 November 1875. One of the treaties in the Pankor Treaty was Perak ceded Dindings to the Straits Settlements, former British Crown Colony on the Strait of Malacca, comprising of Penang, Singapore and Malacca. The Dindings comprised Pankor Island and the town of Rumit on the mainland. Subsequently, Christmas Island, Cocos Islands, and Rabuan also became part of the Straits settlements. The British colonists were ambitious and intend to make Dinding the second miracle of Penang. The British had hoped that Dinding would prove to be a valuable natural harbor. However, this did not become the case. 
Because the area of Pankor Island is too small after all, only 18 square kilometers, which is less than 10% of Penang Island's 293 square kilometers. In addition, Dinding's Chinese people are not as large as Penang. Without the Chinese people's promotion of economic and trade activities, Dinding's colonial tax revenue is not enough for development. In 1935, the British returned Dinding to the Sotan of Parak. The British left scant trace of themselves on Pankor. Beyond a small brick building erected near the Pankor town in 1932, no graven rocks, no ruined fort, not even a place name attested, they have been here before. The building was built to serve the local craving for toddy. However, the building has been demolished. After Dinding's was returned to the Sotan of Parak, Dinding's still retained its original name and expanded its jurisdiction. In 1973, Sotan renamed Dinding's as Manjung. Manjong completely replaced the Dindings area. The original Dinding River was also renamed as Manjong River, but the name of the Dinding Strait, Salat Dinding, that separates Pankor Island from the Malay Peninsula still remains. There are basically two theories about the origin of the name Dinding. According to the first theory, a Malay scholar Dr. Talib Samat believes that Dinding originated from the meaning of red soil in Siamese and later gradually evolved into Dinding. In the 15th century, the Siamese army fought fiercely with the Malay army on the Dinding River. The blood flowed into a river and the soil turned red. Since then, there have been two red soil place names. One area is called Dinding and the other area is called Tanamera, which means red soil in Malay. It was later renamed Rumit, and Rumit is called Hongtukan in Chinese. About the second theory, the local Indian scholar Durai Raja Singham said that the Malay word Dinding means wall, obstacle or partition, because the main mountain range in Parak is like a big barrier, and the British colonists have a base here to combat rampant piracy on the west coast. Hubert Berkeley, the magistrate of Parak in the British colony, once recorded his experience of travelling upstream from the Dinding River to Berluis by canoe. He believed that Dinding was one of the first four names of Parak, because the name Parak did not appear before the 17th century. After the British colonists occupied Dinding, they added s to the word Dinding to become Dindings. Dinding of the British refers to Pankor Island, especially the maps of 1868 and 1882 drawn by the British colonists. Pulo Pankore or Dinding is marked on the map, and the British spelled Pulau Pankor as Pulo Pankore for their convenience. Some British colonial documents are also called Great Dinding, Big Pankor Island, to distinguish Little Dinding, Little Pankor Island, another island southwest of Pankor Island. According to the British colonization, the Dinding without S mostly refers to specific place names, while the Dinding with S mostly refers to the entire Dinding area. As for the former Little Dinding, or Pulau Pankor Gurjiu, it is now a private island and has been restored to its old name Pankor Laut Island. The Chinese propaganda is called Green Sea or Emerald King Island and it is now one of the world's famous resort island. Pankor Laut Island used to be known as Leprosy Island. In the past, leprosy was viewed as an incurable disease. The British government imposed strict segregation policies on the leprosy patients and quarantined them in leprosaria all over the country. In 1892, Mr. Owen, the British regional surgeon, and Mr. Brewster, the district magistrate, was sent to the Pankor Laut Island for investigation. They suggested that the island was suitable for establishing a leper asylum. They were considered the earliest Europeans to visit that island. In 1901, Pulau Pankor Laut was decided to be used as a leper settlement, replacing the previously chosen Pulau Lalang, one of the Pulau Sembalan group. 
Pulau Pangkor Laut being used as a leper settlement in 1903. The first batch of lepers were landed on the island on 9 January 1904. Patients came from Mukams all along the Parak River. The Malay leprosy patients route taken by raft along Parak River to Teluk Anson. From there they took boat to the east coast of Pangkor Laut Island. Pangkor Laut leper settlement closed in 1934. 51 patients were transferred to Sungai Bulo leper settlement. Many years later, leprosy disappeared on the island, and the name of Leprosy Island was changed to Happiness Island, Pulau Bahagia. In May 1945, during World War II, after the fall of Malaya, British officer Freddie Spencer Chapman and others avoided the Japanese army and sneaked into Pangkor Laut's Emerald Bay, and fled to Ceylon under the support of British submarines. Around the year 1960, the late Sotan of Parak, Sotan Idris Iskander Shah discovered the peace and tranquility of Pangkor Laut with its beautiful beaches and mystical tropical forest. Although he never had the chance to live on the island, His Royal Highness made frequent day trips occasionally inviting special guests to enjoy the beauty of Pangkor Laut. Sotan of Parak, Sotan Idris Iskander Shah saw the tourism potential of this island. In 1982, His Highness approached Tan Sri Datok Francis Yeo, Managing Director of Yeo Tiong Lei Corporation, YTL Corp., with the idea of building a resort on the island. The beautiful natural features on the island at once captured Tan Sri Datok Francis Yeo's imagination and fired his enthusiasm which has not waned since. Almost immediately YTL Corp. set about preparing plans for the birth of the project. The resort, albeit in somewhat humble beginnings, was initially named Pen C Resort and officially declared open by former Prime Minister of Malaysia, Tun Datok Seri Dr. Mahathir Mohamad on 18 July 1985. Sadly, Sotan Idris Iskander Shah passed away before the completion of the resort and did not see his dream come to fruition. There are several different theories about the origin of the name of Pangkor Island. There is not much known about the origins of the inhabitants of Pangkor. The local inhabitants believed that the island was protected by the spirits, so they called the island the Spirit Island. During the Dutch colonial period, Pangkor Island was called Pulo Dinding, which means, screen, or, partition. The Dinding River's delta flows into the Straits of Malacca just opposite of the island. This was in reference to the position of the island as it protects the mainland's estuary. When the arrival of the British in 1800, the island was renamed to Pulau Kera or Monkey Island. This was due to the abundance of monkeys on the island. The islanders opposed this name. The British were pressured by the village headman Pengulu Muhammad Nordin bin Mastan to rename it Pulau Aman or Peaceful Island. It was named Pangkor soon after. There are several different theories about the origin of the name of Pangkor Island. The most commonly heard is from the Thai, Panko which means beautiful island. It is said that a long time ago, a Siamese ship found the island when it passed the sea off Pangkor Island. At that time, they thought the island was beautiful. So the Siamese named the island, Beautiful Island. In Thai, Pang is the consciousness of beauty. And the consciousness of Kor is a small island. So the consciousness of Pangkor in Thai is, Beautiful Island. However, others believe it might have been named after Pang Kui, a legendary Chinese adventurer said to have lent his skills in seamanship to bands of pirates this island once sheltered. Another theory of the origin of the name for Pangkor Island. Once upon a time, traders from foreign countries, especially China, often anchored their sails to rest while enjoying the natural beauty of Pangkor Island. Therefore, 
At one time there was a natural disaster where a lightning storm hit the entire ocean. Then the mast of this Chinese merchant's sail broke. Therefore, they could not continue the voyage until they were directed to find a replacement for the broken pole in the forest. During the search, they met a type of tree in the forest that was very good and could be used as a sail pole. The tree is called Penko. Thus was born the word Pankor that remains to this day with the title Pankor Island. Pankor Island has witnessed the colonial history of the Dutch and the British on the island, and also experienced the cruelty of the Japanese army. The Japanese army invaded the Malaya Peninsula on 8 December 1941. The British army surrendered and withdrew from Malaya. During the Japanese occupation of Malaya, many Chinese were persecuted, brutalized, robbed of property, houses burned, murdered and even raped. According to the older generation, the Chinese in Pankor Island were no exception. In the early 1942, Pankor Island was invaded by the Japanese army, and the Japanese army suddenly forced the Chinese in Pankor Island to evacuate the island within three days. During the Japanese occupation, the sanitation of the island was neglected, mosquitoes were infested, and dysentery was prevalent resulting in heavy casualties among the islanders, and a serious plague broke out. In addition, the Japanese army also strictly controlled the prices of various industries, and asked merchants to donate to the Japanese army. In the same year, Ah Ching, Li Han Kuang, one of the members of Force 136, was covered and hired by Chai Kanying on Pankor Island, pretending to be a relative. Chai Kanying has lived on the island for 18 years and used to run a fish store, transportation and grocery business, but he was not a member of the intelligence organization. The Tian Sheng Zan Rice Shop in Sungai Penang Kejiu, Pankor Island was set up to cover up the connection between Pankor Island and the Ipo Intelligence Center and the Rumut Intelligence Substation. Ma Ching also used his good relationship with Shen Dingyuan, the head of the Pankor Island Police Corps, to obtain passes for the personnel of Force 136. Therefore, an Allied spy station was born in Pankor Island. This period was also the most active period for the anti-Japanese movement of overseas Chinese. In January 1943, the British and Chinese governments finally signed an agreement in Chongqing to jointly organize Force 136 to fight against the Japanese army. The headquarters was located in Calcutta, India. Headed by Colonel Goodfellow, and the advisor was Davis, John Davies, and Bloom. Lim Mu Seng and Zhuang Hui Qian were the deputy heads of the Malayan district. The intelligence agents in Perak state included Lim Mu Seng, Chen Chongji, Yu Tiansong, Wu Zaixin, Tan Xianyan, Long Choying, and Li Han Quang. They secretly flew to Pune, India, and entered the British Far East Military Academy for special training. In May 1943, the first and second teams of Malayan assault pioneers were selected to escort Davis and Bloom into Malaya. According to Memoirs of Chen Ping and Selected Historical Materials of the Pacific War, on May 11, 1943, Davis led five pioneers of Force 136 from Columbus to Malaya on a Dutch submarine and landed at Tanjung Hantu, four miles north of Pankor Island, Perak, on the night of May 24. The main task of this trip was to go to Malaya for preliminary investigation, reconnaissance and intelligence gathering. They secretly arranged a ship traffic station in the small town of Pankor Island to receive members of the Allied forces on the submarine. Unfortunately, the intelligence was cracked by the Japanese army, members of the Allied forces were killed, and the islanders were also implicated. The older generation also mentioned that there was once a secret base of the Japanese army in the deep mountains of Pankor Island, but no one knows the exact location. 
On the 2nd of November 1943, the anti-Japanese army took over Lim Mu Seng. Lim Bo Seng recruited the first batch of trained members of Force 136 to actively cooperate with the anti-Japanese war. On the 2nd of November 1943, Lim Bo Seng and Zhuang Hui Qian went ashore in Pulau Sembalan, and was supported by Qin Peng, the leader of the anti-Japanese army, before moving to Mei Luo Mountain to establish a wireless telephone. The self-defense force recruited fishermen from Pankor Island, namely Chen Chongyu and Chen Changvan, to serve as Lim Bo Seng's guide and boatman. In March 1944, the Japanese anti-espionage leader Anishi Satoru was preparing to raid the intelligence agencies of Force 136. The first target of the Japanese anti-espionage organization was Pankor Island and determined that the coalition forces transported funds, munitions, and military equipment to the island through submarines. On the island, they were transferred to the anti-Japanese army. In order to prevent any rumors about the raid on Pankor Island from leaking, the Japanese army imposed martial law in Rumit, Kampong Ko, and Sitiawan. In addition, the area around the island and Sungai Penang Kurjiu had been purged. All ships were prohibited from entering and leaving Pankor Island. Pankor Island suddenly became an isolated island. In March 1944, the Japanese Army's Eagle Dog found out about Lim Mu Seng's intelligence agency and launched a search. Chen Chongyu and Chen Changvan were tortured and tortured, and they sworn to the clues. Although they were released, they were still closely monitored by the Japanese army. Later, Chen Chongyu died by hanging his neck with fishing net rope. As for Chen Changvan, after facing the death of his relatives, he stayed away from disputes. On March 24, 1944, the Japanese army captured Chai Kanying and used him as bait to capture Ah Ching. Chai Kanying was confessed by the arrested anti-Japanese resistor. When being interrogated by the Japanese army, Chai Kanying initially denied any relationship with Force 136, but only stated that he provided money to support the anti-Japanese army. However, the Japanese army didn't believe it, and the captain of the gendarmerie even threatened to kill the whole villager and burn island. Under the pressure of torture, Chai Kanying revealed the whereabouts of Ah Ching, in order to maintain the safety of the entire Pankor Island. The Japanese army carried out a large-scale purge on Pankor Island, and even conducted household registration checks in order to arrest Force 136. Lim Mu Seng and others missed receiving the news of the disintegration of the intelligence agency on the island, so they were unable to get out in time. Around March or April 1944, Lim Bo Seng was captured by the Kempi Tai under Major Anishi Satoru at a roadblock in Gopeng, Parak, and taken to the Kempi Tai headquarters for interrogation. He refused to provide the Japanese with any information about Force 136 despite being subjected to torture. On March 31, 1944, Force 136 was completely destroyed by the Japanese army. Lim Bo Seng was tortured and died of dysentery in the 29th of June 1944. On August 15, 1945, the Emperor of Japan announced his unconditional surrender, and the British army took over power on September 1945. Force 136 and members of the Malayan People's Anti-Japanese Army were freed. The crimes committed by the Japanese Army on Pankor Island were unknown to the younger generation of islanders, and these incidents were gradually forgotten by the islanders as if they had never happened. Pankor Island has a beautiful and romantic legend. According to legend, the Achenese and the Siamese fought on the beach of Teluk Belanga on the northwest coast of Pankor Island in ancient times. The Achenese leader was mortally wounded in the battle. 
He was left behind by his retreating forces. He had been betrothed to a princess. When the princess heard the news of her lover's defeat, she hurried to Pankor Island, trying to negotiate with Siam. But her lover still died of serious injuries. The princess was extremely sad and refused to return to Arche. She mourned on the beach for the rest of her life and disappeared on the beach. In her honor, the beach was named Pantaipu Teri Therwi. Pantaipu Teri Therwi is popularly known as Golden Sands Beach, as the rays of the setting sun glint over the coast, turning sand and sea into a fiery liquid gold. Pankor Island Beach Resort is located at Pantai Puteli, there we. This resort formerly known as Pan Pacific Resort, Pankor. Today, the resort is closed. According to the legend of the older generation of islanders, Pankor Island is shaped like a bat. During the British colonial government, the British built a red lighthouse on the island, and the lighthouse is located on the bat's eye. The islanders believed that the British built the lighthouse will destroy the feng sui of the island, causing the island unable to produce outstanding people. But for this, curse, everyone believes that it has now been broken. Today, the lighthouse still exists. It located on the seaside rocks of the Pankor cargo jetty behind the Galeri Panorama Pankor. But now most people don't know the legend behind the lighthouse. Pankor Island is one of the earliest developed and inhabited islands in Malaysia. The sea areas around the island are rich in fish and seafood. Therefore, in the early years it attracted many Chinese fishermen came to make a living and live there. The Chinese have been in Pankor Island for more than a hundred years. The first place they settled was Teluk Gedong. Later, the Chinese gradually gathered in Sungai Penang Kejiu, Sungai Penang Besar and Pankor Town. Today, Teluk Gedong is dominated by Malay residents. Malays also live in Teluk Kejiu, Teluk Dalam, Teluk Nipper etc. During the British colonial period, a large number of Indian laborers came from South India to Pankor Island. At that time, they mainly gathered in the east part of the island, so this place was called Ji Ling Wan. The name Ji Ling Wan is derived from Cantonese, and Ji Ling refers to India. Ji Ling Wan is called Sungai Penang Kejiu in Malay. This place gradually became the residential area of the Chinese. On the contrary, Indians were scattered to live in various places on the island. There is a hundred-year-old well in Sungai Penang Kerjiu, which is said to have existed since the early days of British colonization. In the past, there was no tap water supply on the island, rainwater or well water became the source of water for the islanders. Until today, the well remains a fond memory for older folks that are still living in the area. Residents here recalled that people crowded around the well to wash clothes early in the morning. Likewise, the children bathe in the refreshing well water in the evening. At that time, water was accessible just by putting your hand over the surface of the well. As time went by, the well water gradually diminished. Another interesting fact about this well is that, possibly due to its proximation to the sea, the well water is noted for its hints of saltiness. The Sri Pathira Kaliaman Temple, also known as Pankor Kaliaman Temple is located in Sungai Penang Basar. It is a unique sea-facing Hindu temple. Many find it a special feature that the temple is so close to the sea. However, it is not so special if you know, that it was actually a temple for fishermen. The temple was originally built in 1890 by Indian immigrants who worked as fishermen or laborers on the island. It was a simple and humble structure made of wood and zinc. Over the years, it underwent several renovations and expansions. They built the temple for the goddess Kaliaman, who would protect him from the turbulent, unpredictable, deadly waves of the sea. 
They had put down a trisulum, trident, camphor, lime lamps, and flower offerings before going to the sea. After a good catch, there was usually an animal sacrifice, which is now no longer practiced. There are many legends of this temple, which describes her predominant presence. A blind man, who used to live near the temple, had always lamented his deplorable condition. One day, the blind man heard a mysterious, raspy voice, instructing him to light oil lamps at the Kaliaman temple, and that his blindness would be cured. He earnestly followed this spiritual edict, and over time his blindness was completely cured. As a mark of devotion, he used to carry Kavadi for Kaliaman during the yearly Mazi Magam festival until he passed away. Another legend was that the granite statue of Kaliaman was stolen by bandits and thrown into the sea. A deeply anguished devotee dreamt of her telling that she was in the sea and gave a precise description of where to find the statue. Soon she was found, and all her devotees rejoiced with a celebration. Many devotees have had scintillating visions of the goddess. Some have seen her sitting on a rock, combing her deep and black hair, under the shiny moon glow of Purnami and Amavasai. Others have seen gentler form of Kaliaman, in the form of a small girl with silver anklets, running around the temple, and its inner sanctum. The Sri Pathira Kaliaman temple was completely rebuilt and reopened in 2019, and now boasts a new shrine. The highlight of this temple is during Mazi Magam, when devotees come to celebrate Kaliaman's birthday. The temple's annual Tiruvila is celebrated with much joy and spiritual glee. Fu Ching Kong Temple is located in Sungai Penang Kejiu, which is the earliest Chinese temple built on the island. According to the building records inside the temple, it was built in 1915. It was initially jointly established by Fujian people and Guangdong Laijiao people, and later it was managed by Fujian people. Fu Ching Kong Temple enshrines Patriarch Ching Sui and King Guangze. Fu Ching Kong Temple is composed of Fujian Association, Hanjiang Association, Guangdong Association, and Hainan Association. They are responsible for managing Chinese graves and worshipping ancestors. This temple also has the characteristics of the integration of Chinese and Indian cultures. During the yearly Mazi Magam festival, devotees will start the procession from Pasir Borgark Beach to Fu Ching Kong Temple at Sungai Penang Kejiu. Devotees must worship in Fu Ching Kong Temple before returning to the Sri Pathira Kaliaman Temple. It is said that Patriarch Ching Sui and another Hindu god in the temple were enshrined and worshipped by the villagers in that temple a long time ago and then the Hindu god was invited and sending to the Sri Pathira Kaliaman temple for worship. Fu Lin Kong temple is located at the foot of a hill in Sungai Penang Basar. It was established in 1930. It was just a simple altar when it was built. After several renovations, expansions and beautifications, it has majestic and magnificent today. The main god of Fu Lin Kong Temple is Li Xian Si, Ti Guai Li. According to legend, a long time ago, there was a sacred shaman, Fuji, beside a black stone. He called himself the god of Li Xian Si, who came to save all living beings and bless the world. Li Xian Si also instructed to build an altar to the east of the boulder to bless the environment and safety. Here, enthusiasts initiated and organized a council to jointly build a simple altar of Fu Lin Kong, as a shelter of God for Li Xian Si. Until 1960, Lin Shui Yi and Yu Mei Chu led the fundraising to rebuild the temple. In 1986, enthusiasts donated a piece of coconut land for the expansion of the temple. In addition, in order to cope with the prosperity and development of Pankor Island's tourism industry, the islanders all worked together to launch a campaign to beautify Fu Lin Kong Temple. 
The beautification plan includes the construction of a 500-foot-long mini Great Wall, Yerming Pavilion, Wulong Pavilion, Guanyin Pool, Longevity Bridge, and Malay traditional houses with multi-racial elements. One day, the abbot of the temple found hair growing on the drum skin. Later, the news gradually spread, and the islanders flocked to see its appearance one after another, and they all found it incredible. Some people think that it is the apparition of the gods, while others say that it should be analyzed from a scientific point of view. Many people believe that if you pluck the hair and put it in your wallet, you will get rich. In 1991, when former Prime Minister Dator Mahathir Mohamad visited the temple, he also suggested that the drum must be framed, to avoid hair plucking. Pankor Island Walian Primary School is the earliest school established on the island with a history of 100 years. Huao Min Primary School and Ding Tai Zing Primary School were the predecessor of Walian Primary School. Huao Min Primary School was built in Pankor Town, while Ding Tai Zing Primary School was built in Sungai Penang Kejiu. These two primary schools were established in 1920. In the early days of their establishment, both schools implemented free education, and each had around 20 students. In 1925, due to the increasing number of students, the two schools jointly established Pankor Huao Min Ding Zing Public School, located in Sungai Penang Basar. In the beginning of January 1942, the Japanese army invaded Pankor Island, the schools on the island were closed, and the students were suspended. In August 1945, after the Japanese army surrendered and left Pankor Island, the democratic groups were formed to resume school. In the beginning of 1946, the school opened smoothly. In the same year, Jung Huao Primary School opened. It was built next to the Fukien Association at Sungai Penang Kejiu. On June 20, 1948, the British government implemented the Emergency Act, and a large-scale raid was carried out across Malaysia. School directors and many teachers were arrested and imprisoned, and even deported. The schools on Pankor Island were also closed. In 1951, the residents of the whole island and the directors of the two schools, Huao Min Ding Zing Public School and Jung Huao Primary School, agreed to merge the two schools and named them Pankor Walian School. At that time, the main school was located in Sungai Penang Basar while Sungai Penang Kejiu and Pankor Town were branch schools. In 1952, Walian Primary School held the first sports day. In 1954, the headmaster Zhang Ji Ching planned with the board of directors, they decided to purchase a 12-acre piece of land at Pasir Bogar for the purpose of building a school. In 1957, Pankor Island Walian Primary School was completed with the joint efforts of all islanders. Later, the first branch school was established in Sungai Penang Kejiu. In the same year, a land was rented to build a second branch school at Pankor Town. Soon after, the primary school at Sungai Penang Basar was repaired as the third branch school. Later, due to the increasing number of students, the main school at Pasir Bogar expanded the school building and completed a majestic and well-equipped school building. The construction funds of the four schools up to 300,000 ringgit. In December 1962, the new school building opened, and the number of students had reached more than 1,400. In 1963, the headmaster Zhang Ji Ching retired. He has made great contributions to Walian Primary School throughout his life, and he can be called the father of Walian's development. In 1965, the Ministry of Education ordered that Walian School be divided into two parts. After the division, school at Pasir Bogar was the main school, Sungai Penang Basar and Sungai Penang Kejiu schools were branch schools. In 1967, 
the headmaster Shi Jian Ching planned to rebuild the Sungai Penang Basar Branch School, which was enthusiastically responded by the Board of Directors and Islanders, and received generous donations from enthusiastic Chinese educators inside and outside the island. The new campus of the Sungai Penang Basar Branch School was finally completed in 1969. Today, only the main school and the second branch of Walian School on the island remain, and the rest were closed and demolished long time ago. Pangkor Island has been listed as a duty-free island since January 2020. There are four duty-free islands in Malaysia, namely Langkawi, Labuan, Tioman, and Pangkor is the fourth duty-free island. In fact, this news was announced in October 2017 when the former Prime Minister and Finance Minister Najib Abdul Razak presented the budget. It is hoped that the duty-free island can attract more foreign investment, promote local economic development, and attract more tourists. With beautiful beaches, simple fishing villages, rich culture, historical sites and legends, Pangkor Island is a popular holiday destination for tourists from all over the world.